Hey, you own a business? Maybe we should consider advertising on the show. See if we can make a little bit of money. My email address is scott at scotthorton.org. Hey, y'all, guess what? You can now order transcripts of any interview I've done for the incredibly reasonable price of two and a half bucks each. Listen, finding a good transcriptionist is near impossible, but I've got one now. Just go to scotthorton.org slash transcripts, enter the name and date of the interview you want written up, click the PayPal button, and I'll have it in your email in 72 hours max. You don't need a PayPal account to do this. Man, I'm really going to have to learn how to talk more good. That's scotthorton.org slash transcripts. All right, you guys. I'm me. It's my show, Scott Horton's show. I got Eric Margulies on the line. Hey, Eric, how are you, man? I'm fine, Scott. Just uh, writing about Turkey at this moment. Another big disaster area. Yeah, another compared to what? Oh, yeah, that list. To Afghanistan, <laughs> Iraq. And Palestine. Syria, you name it. Man. All right. Well, so listen, everybody. The reason that I have you listen to Eric all the time is because, uh, yeah, he knows what he's talking about. He's covered 14 wars, wrote a couple of books about it, War at the Top of the World, American Raj, that is Empire, Liberation or Domination, and uh, really is expert on all these places, been to all these places, and I almost sort of kind of don't know where to begin, but let's talk about Afghanistan here, uh, Eric. Dear Leader says... Um, the the troops that didn't leave at the end of last year, like in the deal, uh, they're staying for at least another few years. Uh, of course, this is in reaction to the fall of Kunduz. And there's a great article by uh, Tom Englehart, in fact, today, uh, where he's quoting uh, uh, DIA guys or, or whatever, CENTCOM guys from a couple of months ago saying, Oh, yeah, you know, the Taliban, they've been doing little hit-and-run attacks around Kunduz for a little while here, but we're pretty sure that that's never going to amount to anything and that Kunduz is in no danger of actually being attacked itself or anything like that. <laughs> it was just a couple of months ago. Now the whole thing's fallen and they've decided, I don't know if they were ever leaving or not, but now at least they're admitting that they never were. Um, but so then what do you think is going to happen? I think uh, what's going to happen is that American troops will remain like a British imperial garrison during the 19th century, and they'll be there long enough to hold uh, some major cities and the American air bases, same thing that the British Empire did in Iraq, and uh, they'll keep their puppet government, uh, Ashraf Ghani, in power, and uh, pretend everything is good, and uh, but really, America also has four of uh, thirty-five thousand mercenary troops in Afghanistan, uh, and these guys will remain and work America's will. Mm. Well, now, so but here's the problem with the Mercs and even the so-called professional army. I don't know if you're trying to distinguish there <laughs> between the Afghan army and Mercs. That's pretty much all they are. <laughs> They're only fight for a paycheck. So when the Taliban come, they run. Because they're not there to fight for God and country and, and this and that. They're there fighting for to try to get a little bit ahead before they have to quit. That's right. And many of them are from ethnic minorities like uh, Tajiks and Uzbeks, uh, with whom the Americans have allied themselves, immediately making them enemies of the majority of uh, Pashtuns. But the, the American paid mercenaries are much more reliable. They're the scum of the gutter from all over the world. They're professional gunmen. Uh, they're not as likely to run away as the useless uh, Afghan army. Mm. So in other words, you're saying basically they're going to keep enough power to keep the Taliban out of Kabul. They're going to have enough American and, and allied mercenary and NATO and whatever power to keep the Taliban from taking the capital city. Maybe take back Kunduz? Well, Scott, uh, yes. Uh, I think the Taliban has pulled out of Kunduz for a very good reason that uh, the U U.S. Air Force is blasting the hell out of it. Oh, they already have retreated then. Yeah, and uh, as we saw in last week's uh, horrifying attack on the Médecins Sans Frontières Hospital in uh, Kunduz by an American C-130 gunship, uh, America, it's American air power that is decisive in Afghanistan. If the if the U.S. Air Force was not on call 24-7 in the skies over Afghanistan, America would be run out. Its troops would be cut off, uh, and uh, they'd have to flee for their lives, just like the British did three or four times in the 19th century. 
It's all thanks to the Air Force that we keep our imperial banner flying uh, in the Hindu Kush, however, comma, it costs a mint. Yeah. Well, and even then, I mean, obviously they're keeping the Taliban from rolling into Kabul the way ISIS rolled into Mosul kind of thing in a big convoy, but they can pretty much just sneak their guys in there a few at a time and and maybe do some kind of Tet Offensive type of thing from the inside. I mean, they've only got uh, what a couple of 10,000 guys, including the Mercs and all of that. How many did the Taliban have? They're at least from there. they got to be able to field more than the Americans at this point, no? Oh, yes, they do, but it's not numbers of infantry, uh, volunteer infantry that will decide the war. You know, I covered, I was there in Afghanistan when the Najibullah regime, another puppet regime that was backed by the Soviets, was left to confront its enemies with the Mujahideen, who were our freedom fighters, as President Reagan called them. They only turned into terrorists afterwards. And uh, what was what became very clear is that any Afghan with with uh, even a tiny IQ had made secret deals with the opposition, knowing that the Soviet puppet regime would not survive. Everybody called up their cousin Abdul, who was in the Taliban, and made deals so that a lot of things that happened were arranged in advance. And uh, the Afghans are, you know, have been at war forever. They've learned to uh, to prepare and to plan for these kind of changes. Yeah. All right. Now, so, hey, let me ask you real quick about what's going on in, uh, especially in East Jerusalem, but in Palestine, what you make of it is, do you think there's a major change coming to the status of the Al-Aqsa Mosque there? Uh, I hope not, but uh, it is possible because Israel's right wing, far right wing, which are very dominant, has made this a major issue and wants to implant uh, Jewish control or increase it over the Aqsa Mosque, which is the second holiest site in uh, Islam. And I, I, you know, I find uh, feuding and fighting over religious things to be exceptionally distasteful. And, and, and low IQ. But both sides are at it, hammer and tongs, and the Israeli uh, security forces are shooting down Palestinians in the street. They said they had a knife for their attackers, but the situation is growing uh, much more dangerous. But unfortunately, the only way Palestinians can fight is that stabbings, rock throwings, and having large numbers of their people killed so that it stays in world headlines. Yeah. And now, so do you think that the Palestinians have good reason to fear that the Israelis are going to just take it over and kick them out and start rebuilding the Third Temple or some crazy thing? I don't think that's going to happen, at least not now. But I think the Israelis will use salami tactics to expand their control over Al-Aqsa and to deny access to more and more Palestinians so uh, that they can then begin some sort of Temple Mount renovation. But th- this is going to take, take a while, and it's going to be a bloody business. All right. Well, um, I guess uh, I'll try to have you back uh, either tomorrow or Monday or as soon as I can about your turkey article as soon as it comes out, because there's a lot to learn about that place that I got to do here, and I think a lot of the audience is with me on that. So uh, very much looking forward to talking with you about that thing as soon as it comes out. It's a deal, Scott. All right, good deal. Thanks very much, Eric. That is the great Eric Margulies, everybody. EricMargulies.com. Spell it like Margolis. EricMargulies.com. You can find him at LewRockwell.com all the time, too. We'll be right back in just a sec. Hey, all Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new ebook by longtime future freedom author Scott McPherson. Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment and the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. This is the definitive principled case in favor of gun rights and against gun control. America is exceptional. Here the people come first, and we refuse to allow the state a monopoly on firearms. Our liberty depends on it. Get Scott McPherson's Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms on Kindle at Amazon.com today. Don't you get sick of the Israel lobby trying to get us into more wars in the Middle East? Or always abusing Palestinians with your tax dollars? It once seemed like the lobby would always have full-spectrum dominance on the foreign policy discussion in D.C. But those days are over. The Council for the National Interest is the America Lobby, standing up and pushing back against the Israel Lobby's undue influence on Capitol Hill. Go show some support at CouncilForTheNationalInterest.org. That's CouncilForTheNationalInterest.org. 
Hey, I'll Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. If this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium, and they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Robertson Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co.